so this session, right? Um, so Mike and I, we speak to a lot of people about careers. Um, Mike is an information security professional by trade. Um, he's, this is the announcing part. So Mike's an information security professional by trade. Um, and he's got a real big interest in careers, and he does a lot of help with people through mentorship and um, just to help guide a lot of you know a lot of young folks in their careers. And um, my role, um, I actually run an executive search firm in the information security space, um, and we place people across the country in roles that go from chief security officers all the way down through um, security analysts. Work with all different types of companies products, services, corporate stuff. And um, Mike and I met at Black Hat probably about six years ago or so. And it was kind of interesting because he had this real interest in careers. Um, and then about, about three years ago, we got together and um, we started to um, kind of collaborate a little bit more on talks. We did a couple things over at DEF CON. And um, about a year ago, um, we started a blog um, called infosecleaders.com, and uh, you know, it's not that we contribute a lot regularly on the blog, but the one thing that we do on a regular basis on the blog is we do something called Career Advice Tuesday, and um, it's kind of a way where you know anybody who can ask a question um, or has a question that pertains to their career. Um, they can ask it basically anonymously, and we'll post it up the site basically anonymously. Oh, it's bad already. <laughs> but you know, we post it on the site anonymously, and really, you know, what we try to do is to take personal questions and give them a little bit of a broader appeal, so that everybody can benefit from the advice and guidance. Um, when people work for their careers, you know, your career is very much an individual thing. You know, something that that that's interesting to you might not be interest, interesting to the person sitting next to you. So um, when we talked to uh, Jeff and Ping about, you know, they said, hey, look, you know, could you guys do like, like a Career Advice Tuesday session live here and, you know, give the audience and the attendees a chance to ask whatever questions that they want about their careers? And um, we thought it was a good idea. Um, and look, anything that, um, so the, the, the basis of the session here is really, you know, it's your session. Um, you know, I'd ask that, you know, the one ground rule is that, you know, whatever happens here kind of stays here. I didn't, I didn't make that up. But, um, but just the idea is that, you know, people are going to ask some questions that are personal to them um, just to make sure that, uh, you know, nobody judges anybody. Um, and, um, you know, as much as you want to talk about, you know, the specifics of your, your, personal, your, of your questions, um, we'd be happy to go into as much detail as possible. Um, if we run out of questions, Mike and I have some questions that we've built on our own that might help, um, that are common questions that we get. Um, but in general, I mean, um, I guess the best way to say is this, is that um, I, I guess to start to give you guys maybe a little bit of a backdrop, um, we did this talk, um, we did this compensation survey this past, uh, oh goodness, what was it, the, the spring of this yeah. year, right? And um, the survey itself, we, I mean, and it was just kind of an interesting point because people have some very interesting ideas, ideas about compensation. And it was just a 15-question survey that we put together. And it was really talking about people's attitudes towards compensation. And I just want to give you guys a little bit of data from that that I think you guys might find interesting. So, um, and a lot of these questions really kind of come out about perception um, and the perception of, which, are you going to pull one of the slides up? Um, I mean, and, and, and really talking about the individual nature of the careers, about what really matters to the individual themselves. And so we asked the question, say, instead of money, if you had to accept less compensation for your job, what would you be willing to trade? And, um, you know, we found some interesting stuff. Um, we found that the number one answer that we received was, 49% people said, and, and, and you, could, you could pick as many question, answers as you wanted, but 49% of the respondents basically said, I take more money to, less money to save my own ass. I thought that number would be higher, but um, 
I thought that was fair. I think that that kind of showed a lot of confidence that people felt that they could get another job, that if they were told that they had to take less money, that they would sooner go out and get other employment. Um, but I think the thing that was the most fascinating thing to both of us was that 47%, almost the same amount of people said that they would take less money in their job if they got more education and more training. So the concept is this, is that say getting more training is basically equivalent to saving your own ass. It's kind of interesting that it's so close, but it shows how important that training, education, and professional development is to information security professionals as a whole. And then the other stuff that was interesting is that um, about the same, you know, between 35 and 38 percent of the folks said that uh, things like uh, work less hours, more vacation time, the ability to telecommute, that all those three main quality of life issues became very important, um, you know, were very important. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting stuff. Um, we also got another piece of information that was, you know, we, we, we started to talk to people about information security professionals' attitudes towards compensation. And I think that the one thing that we kind of found was um, there were some real big perception issues. Yeah, no, no question. I mean, it, we, we tend to be very, we believe that as security people, we are more valuable than, than our peers in IT. That we, because we're security people, we deserve more than the other IT people. So, I mean, so let's, so, so let's just do a random sampling because there's going to be some audience participation anyway. So just ask a couple of questions, right? So because you're an information security professional, how many of you believe that you should earn more money than somebody with the same skills but an, another IT professional but who doesn't have security as part of their discipline? How many people believe that they should earn a lot more money? Right? So in our survey, right, 50%, half the audience, half the respondents said that they believe that they should earn a bit more than IT. And 33% said that they should earn a lot more because they're security. So, so total of eight, uh, what was it, 83% of us? 83% is like five, it was like basically five out of six, which is pretty interesting, yeah. right? And, um, so here's another question we asked. How, how many people feel that they're underpaid in their job? About half the room. How many people feel that they're overpaid? About zero. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, in the survey, right, 60% of the respondents felt that they were underpaid, and only 3% of the folks thought they were overpaid. And um, so last year, here's another one. How many people got a salary increase last year? Only like yeah, about half got a salary increase. About Anything half. like so. Let me how, of, of everybody who had a salary increase, how many people were disappointed in the amount of their salary increase? About half of that. Yeah. How many people were pleasantly surprised? Right. So the, it, so 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 the ratio is basically somewhere between five and six to one of disappointed to surprised. In our survey, 50% of the folks were disappointed, and only 10% were pleasantly surprised. So I think that the one thing that we can see here when you look at this data is that there's some really big, strong messaging disconnects between people's individual's perception and the marketplace perception. And I think that that's one of the big reasons are the big divides when it comes down to job satisfaction, when it comes down to people feeling good about the work that they're doing and getting really maximum value out of their information security career. Completely. So want to take questions? No, uh, yeah, I mean so you wanna go through you wanna go through that a little bit, Mike? Because No, I was gonna wait. Let's okay. let's do some let's do some live questions if anybody's got one. Anybody got a question? Hold on, before you ask it, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Vanna White thing and run around, and actually make sure that you end up on mic for the people at home. Yeah, so you started out at the start by comparing salaries of infosec professionals to IT professionals, and um, 
I voted that InfoSec professionals should be paid more. And my perception just is that there's um, many more people in IT and much more uh, of um, just many more people uh, in there are that fewer job market. In, there are fewer the, information security Fewer pros. information security, sure. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't that justify higher pay in, uh, in InfoSec if there's a higher demand? Well, if you're an information security professional, it justifies that to you. But in corporate HR functions, they don't differentiate. Yeah. So I, I'm, I think it's a specialization. You, would you say, by saying, I everybody in IT is specialized. You're a DBA. You're a security person. It's not any different. But we think our specialization is somehow more valuable than the other ones, right? It's not. It's not that there are there are probably not that many more DBAs in the world or Sun, you know, Sun Unix administrators in the world than there are security people. Everybody's got their own specialization. So the idea that our specialization is somehow more equal than all the other ones, and, that, and that's where what Lee was just saying, um, the, corporate I, the corporate HR function goes, well, this is just one more checkbox on my list. The, co the company doesn't really care. So when we work with a large company, if we work with a large financial services institution or a large... Uh, retail company, when they're hiring for security, they basically have, does anybody have salary bands in their jobs or um, salary numbers that come? So those numbers are not security specific numbers. Those numbers from an HR perspective cut across the entire company. So when they're figuring out what to pay you, they're looking, there's they're something that they refer to as called internal equity. And what they're trying to do is to create more of a standardized blueprint across the company to manage costs and to make sure that there becomes a degree of normalcy throughout the organization. And security in the 90s, maybe the early 2000s, were able to get more of a skill set premium. But now as security has become, you know, we've accomplished our goal. We've become more mainstream. We're more accepted by corporations. Corporations have a security function. And because we've been so good at making ourselves a standard or a component of corporate infrastructure, we have to play by the same rules. So thinking that we don't is a big fallacy. Sir. Oh. Why are you mad? isn't really a, a money thing, but uh, so I guess if you are an information security professional in a, cor in a corporate environment, oh, sorry about that. If you're a security professional in a corporate environment, not a government environment, whether it be uh, network security, what have you, in your head, you're thinking to yourself, okay, my job is to protect this company. So in that light, I deserve more than the guy who is selling the product of this company because what I do actually has a bigger stake. If what I do, if I slack off or if I don't do my job correctly, bad things could really happen. Whereas if that guy doesn't do his job, maybe he doesn't sell as much. Well, if there are no sales, then you all don't have jobs. That's true. So, I mean, everybody, <laughs> so the thing is this, is that we, have, we all have our own vanity. We all believe that we're more important than we truly are. I think that everybody who comes to work has a certain sense of professional pride. So they believe there's a sense of importance that if I don't do my job, then this is the consequence. But those consequences can be applied to every position. So I think that you know one of the bigger trends in corporate America would be instead of, and it's probably a different way to think, but when we start hiring executives, security leaders, chief security officers, they stop thinking about how the chief security person can save the company money or protect them. Security professionals have to begin to think about how is security going to enable the business to make money? So there is definitely a bigger shift that's happening right now is that when we look for chief security officers and I sit with CFOs and CEOs of companies and saying we need to fix our security problem, we need to make this a world-class security function, Instead of asking for a security professional who understands business, 
They ask us for a business leader who understands security. So it becomes, there's becoming a shift in the market that should really start permeating how we think of our careers. Ultimately, you know, that shift towards, towards moving out of the cost center role and moving towards being a business driver is something we really haven't talked about as an industry. We're all still, our headspace, I mean, even this whole conference, our headspace is in um, technology and how we do all the cool stuff. Um, far too few of us are thinking, all right, how does what I do make the company money? Just not seeing it. Oh, sure it does. Well, uh, well, it, it is and it isn't. Let me give you an example. Um, I worked for, um, for a large insurance company for a while. And one of the things that we tried to push for security was that security allowed us to um, negotiate better contracts with certain vendors. We were able to, because we could position ourselves as, as having less risk, we were a less risky business partner. At this point, we're driving the company's revenue generation, right? We're actually, we're putting ourselves in a position where that risk management function allows the company to be more competitive within the field of offering different, you know, incentives in the contract. I that's also the kind of thought, that's the kind of thinking that we need to start to go towards. So, I, and a lot of times at the executive level in security, security gets baked into key customer pursuits because the vet, just for the very reasons that Mike aligned right there, is that the ability for a secure partner to be seen as a business advantage over or against, against other weaker partners, um, sometimes it's more about having better than your competitors, but being able to articulate that message in a multi-hundred million dollar type contract win, that becomes humongous. So, I mean, that's just one example, but security is getting more and more baked into the acquisition process as opposed to the defense process. It's the same thing that uh, businesses went through in the 80s with quality. You know, it, up until, up until the, the Japanese revolution in the 80s, it, it, quality was really looked at as something that you didn't really have to spend on because you could spend a whole lot of money and get quality, but then you'd lower your profit margins. And then they figured out uh, the slogan from the Deming people was quality is free. That if you put in enough quality, more people will buy your product, more people will be interested in you, and you will end up making more money by putting that investment in. And you're right, it's risk management. Quality is risk management, security is risk management. Ultimately, all it is is managing your company effectively, managing your company well, and that's a business advantage. That's a business driver. And if you can, if you can teach the organization to articulate that to their customers and in the sales cycle, you become part of the business process. And, and one of your goals as a security professional should be able to, if you're working in a corporate, to find ways to demonstrate to your employer that you're making them money and not saving them money. Questions? Oh, hold on. Thank you. Uh, in my world, what I see is the uh, headcount for pure play InfoSec people dropping. And I was wondering, that that's in my small world, and your broad view of the industry, uh, what are you seeing, especially looking up to the five to 10 year uh, timeline? Are you, are, you, are you seeing more pure play infosec jobs get rolled back into IT, making security part of everyone's job? I'll, tell, I'll, I'll put my spin on this. I've said for a while that I think infosec is going away um, as a pure discipline. There are two real functions in our world today. There is the risk management function and the thinking about limiting business risk, limiting risk of loss, compliance, um, you know, governance, things like that. And then there's the operations function. Well, we've already started to see the model of this. Things that used to be traditional infosec things like firewall management. Well, how many, how many of you guys, your firewall management group doesn't report to your CISO, it reports to your network operations guy, right? A lot, almost uh, most of the big companies that I work with, they're rolling firewall management into network engineering. They're rolling, you know, uh, what used to be vulnerability management into server ops just as the patch cycle. And so these operational things move towards that. 
the risk management things move towards the governance group. Legal, compliance, financial risk management, if you're at a financial services firm. They're already doing a lot of that. They already have a lot of the people thinking about similar problems in different areas. So I think you're going to see a lot of the InfoSec thinkers move more into, more into that group. You, you see there being less role for that pure play InfoSec person. And you end up be, be asking yourself the question, do I want to be an IT InfoSec person or do I want to be a risk management InfoSec person? And over the next 10, 20, 30 years, I think we probably find that, that the pure play, I mean, there's always going to be a role for the pure play information security person, but it's not going to be, um, I, I remember like five, six years ago, people used to talk about how InfoSec would be the biggest group within IT. I, I think that's... I think that's a ludicrous idea. Well, so I'll give you, uh, I have a, a client and um, a friend of mine, somebody I know for about 12 or 15 years. He's the CISO of a, we'll call it a Fortune 50 large financial, so one of the largest companies in the world. And his last role was to be the um, senior VP of security operations. And he said to me, called me up one day, he said, you know, I have a very interesting job. He said, the more I fit, the more efficient that I am in my job will be, you know, will, will be when I actually work myself out of a job. And his job was to eliminate all the IT security operations functions or to outsource them um, to um, India and Asia. And so, do I think that there? And so it's kind of interesting, right? You know, the government, the, the big articles before the show, the twenty thousand people. We need the gov our government needs. They have assessed that we need twenty thousand information security professionals. So who's right? And I, I think the the answer is this: is that security will continue to be a discipline, but it will be rolled into, it will become a component of other positions. And, you know, I don't think that you might not have dedicated, more dedicated security headcount. Your security headcount might become more strategic as opposed to less, ta you know, as opposed to more tactical. Um, so I think that that's something that we have to think about with our careers. You know, I mean, you have to think about that in a broader horizon. What's the shelf life of my technical skills? What's the law of diminishing returns? How much would somebody really be willing to pay me if I'm the best, insert technical skills, technical security skill here, person? And we, I mean, that's the, the, the uh, firewall engineer model is a, is a good one to look at. If you go back to 1997, firewall engineers were hot. You could do firewall engineering. You were, you know, you were very employable. Um, you, you weren't and, very employable. You, you were. I mean, you could write your own ticket in New York City. I mean, if we found somebody, people with. I've been recruiting since 1996 in this space, right? But we were able to find people who had checkpoint firewall skills in that time. 130, 140, 150, and up. And because now, it was supply demand, right? And, and now it's a it's a component of the network engineering job, and it's sort of you know entry level skill. It's expected, right? You'd be expected to know how to administer a firewall. How much of the cool stuff that we do today will be in that same model thirteen years from now? I mean, think about pen testing, right? Think about the shift in pen testing from networks to wireless, web application software security you're starting to see look web apps are still pretty hot but they're fizzling a little bit you know web app security web app pen testing was a lot hotter three years ago and you start thinking about where it is now and now you're seeing a little bit more forensics is coming to become a little bit more of a hotter skill incident response incident management breach management these are all newer things that are kind of moving. So I think that one of the things you have to think about in your career is that if you could mark where you are now, figure out where you might want to be, and understand what you need to do to enhance your current skill set so that you do not become obsolete. Nobody wants to be the last buggy whip maker. Not many buggies running around the streets. Questions? 
You want to? Okay, I'll do it. You can run this time. So, do you guys see any trends uh, from a converged environment standpoint, say private cloud, public cloud? And I realize that those terms are overused at this point, but <clears throat> do you see? Uh, so, you know, for instance, if you move your environment into a private cloud or a public cloud, what's the role of the infosec professional? When, you know, in the cloud. So my my business partner made a funny uh, made a funny statement at, at, in one business meeting. One of those non sequiturs that just comes out. Somebody asked him about how do you do how do you do security in the cloud? How do you handle that? And he said same way as on the ground. And I, I really thought that that was a, a a poignant idea. I I don't think we've I don't think we've really shifted that much in terms of our role in cloud security because cloud security is ultimately just a question of you know, the data is in a different place. The data has different exposure. How's that any different than what we've had to do as peop as data got more mobile? You know, you, we have to deal with USB keys and USB drives and data moving more easily. It's just a new storage location for data. And I think, I, I don't think that there's a radical redesign in the entire, the principles of risk, threat, vulnerability, and, and value still they're, they're, they're the same. It's just a, a slightly different calculation. It's always prudent. So it depends on what you're at, what you're asking. From a career perspective, it's always prudent to be studying what the next thing is. I think you kind of have to, especially in our industry. I, I rant about our industry a lot because I think our industry is probably one of the hardest industries in in the entire world to make a career in, because the security issue is always in the new technology. It's never in. You never very rarely see something that's. Oh, this is a vulnerability in a 13-year-old piece of technology that no one's ever found before. It's always in the new stuff. So unlike accounting, where the rules have basically been the same other than a few tweaks for the last 100 years, our industry, if you knew, if you knew today what you knew in 2005, you would be so obsolete in this industry that you wouldn't even be worth talking to. So as that far, might be a little bit everybody's worth talking to. <laughs> well, you know, but you, as far as Mike might be a little overboard from a hiring perspective, from a hiring perspective, you would be so far behind the game that you're not even relevant. Um, whereas in lots of other fields, that's not five years is nothing. But in ours, five years is huge. So the idea of being ahead of it, uh, absolutely. You're and you're you're bang on cloud and moving to converged environments and the whole thing is going to change our skill set a lot. We're going to have to learn a whole lot of new stuff that we've never learned before. Does it change our role completely? I don't think so. I think we're still the same people. We, but, but it's the same question. If you, I, I bet if, I was, if we had a time machine and I could have done this talk in 2003, you would have asked me the same question about wireless networks. And Maybe how, in a different form, though. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's the same, it would have been the same kind of question. Now everything's going to be wireless. How does that change our world? It didn't. We had to learn a whole bunch of new stuff. We had to deal with a whole bunch of, you know, oh, crack. Oh, crap. Web is cracked. Let's, we got it. Now our wireless is all messed up. We're going to have to learn that stuff. There's lessons there. So, so but it's the same kind of lessons we've learned with other new technologies along the way. So, so, the, so the key here is this, right? I mean, so like to take you into... Um, the value cycle within an organization or as companies look for skill and look for talent, right? So if I could put that spin on it is that when companies go out and they're hiring, right? When something new is a new technology, a new technology, a new business function, whatever it might be, initially what they do is they need to start seeking out people who can help them solve their problem. And the more current your skills relate to the future problems that a company will have, the more leverage or the more 
in demand. It's a supply. De it's a simple supply demand scenario. So the idea of being able to position yourself in a way where you can become more valuable and that you can leverage the skill set that you currently have to look forward, I think that's a big thing, right? Looking forward. I think a lot of people get enamored with their press clippings and they talk about how many articles they wrote and how many conferences that they spoke at and all this other stuff. At the end of the day, it's really about your skill. And it's really about your ability to solve somebody's problem. And if that's the case, the employer will get something that they need, and you can leverage that skill to get something that you want. And you think about that. You think about all well, when you're selecting a position, right? What do you guys think about when you select it? If you're changing jobs, what are things that you think about? But when you're making a decision, if I was going to leave my employer to go to another employer, that's what you're thinking? You're thinking, what's the, the vendor doing? Or it's OK. So you're trying to think, like, what can I get out of it that I don't already have? OK, that's good. Anybody else? Back? So you're looking for commitment. That's commitment. Anybody else? Go for it. Travel. Quality of life. Cash. Ca Cash and education. Those so, are all. You, so you're looking for what's in it for me type of scenario. Brass tax. Better quality of life. More money. Self-preservation is our greatest drive. So the best part about these answers is that all these answers are unique to the individual, and they're all right. And I think that the one thing that you can pull from these things is that you have to determine your list of things that are important to you if you are going to switch positions. I think that, the, and this is going to sound completely crazy coming from somebody who makes their living off people changing positions. The best advice that I give most people is to remain in their job and to make their job work for them. It's crazy, right? I mean, that was just crazy, right? But the idea is this, is that you build internal brand in your job. People know you. They count on you. They already know what they can go to you for. You built relationships. Those types of things have a tremendous amount of value. So in a lot of cases, what happens is people give up too early. What you have to be able to do is figure out how to social engineer your position to get the skills out of it that you want and after you try and try, and if you can't do that, at that point in time, you should look elsewhere. But when you look elsewhere, make sure that when you look elsewhere, you're getting something for that risk. You have to get something for that risk. And whatever you get is unique to you. Sometimes you can change jobs for money. Sometimes you can change jobs for quality of life, or commute, or to learn a new skill, or for a different program. But you have to think about that. Before you go out and change, you should have a game plan for doing so. The last thing you want to do is change jobs and watch all you got was a new golf shirt. You got the same job, but just a different color golf shirt. Let me think about that. Don't hurt yourself, Mike. I swear. All right.
Uh, does your advice to people vary by their age? And what I'm thinking of is, you know, even though it's illegal in the United States, you know, it's it's much harder to hold down that infosec job, IT job, whatever job in a corporate environment, the nice paying corporate environment as you advance to 50 and 60 and beyond. Uh, what I'm getting at there is, I guess the second part of my question, how do you feel about advising on moonlighting? You have to go build your own job later in case you get displaced permanently as you go to 50, 55, 60 and beyond. Well, so let me address that, right? So obviously just from your two questions, I could tell that that's something that's really creeping, right? So let's just say a couple things. It's good. I mean, look, to ignore that ageism, racism, genderism, whatever you want to call it, to ignore that that's something that doesn't exist behind all the EOE statements that are out there, you, after 15 years of doing that, you can't convince me that it doesn't. Right, And I've worked with very small companies. I've worked with very big companies. I've worked with very structured HR functions and very non-existent HR functions, right? I think when it comes down to this is that when you look at any skill, you look at value. And I think that instead of moonlighting to go out and trying to hedge your bet a little bit, I think you'd be better off making yourself so valuable to your organization that they can't afford to get, in other words, they're better than any other existing option. And you can say to somebody, say, look, I'm not, at this point in my career, I'm not interested in promotions. I'm, you can have, many people don't communicate openly with their employers. A lot of managers believe that their employees want the same exact things out of their careers as they want for theirs. So if you're in a situation where you're saying, hey, look, I really like my job, and I would just get so darn good at it that when they say who's the best person on the team, you're the guy. So I think that if you could take that effort that you might divert other, wares, other way and push it down into your job and into your own development, if you do that and your company doesn't like you, you're going to be valuable outside to other employers too. You could go do 1099 contracting because in those situations, they don't care about career development. They just care about skill. I actually I got a, a good example of that. Um, I worked with a guy at one point who was one of three experts in the world on a particular part of mainframe security. I mean uber, uber specialized. But I mean, this guy was the best of the best. You can write your own ticket on that one thing. So the question is, uh, you know, what do you want to be known for? We talk a lot about branding. We talk a lot about the importance of being known for something, being known as something specifically. Um, and we talk a lot about that because ultimately, what you're known for will, if you, if you can establish a brand, whatever that brand is, um, best guy on the team for doing X. If X is a valuable thing, you will always have a position. I'm, you know, and whether, if the position's not there, the position will be somebody, somewhere else. You were gonna say something? Here. You're, com you're saying that you should make yourself valuable to your company. Right. So are you talking more at the managerial, director, VP? Because your VP may think, okay, my team, the groups that are under me are great. But if your EBV says, guess what? We're going to outsource the whole lot. You're shit out of luck. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, look, you know what? I mean, you know, organizations get redlined all day long for business situations. But if you're making your skills valuable, like one of the things that you have to think about is that when you're going out and choosing to develop your skills, in addition to my current employer, other companies in the area, if the skill that I'm developing, will they be valuable to the other companies around? So you have to have a 360 view of your marketplace, your current skills, and if you're going to go out and build and make some more investments in yourself, yes, you can get redlined, but if you get redlined, you should know, ah, if something bad comes down, what are my options? 
And I think that it's our own kind of career contingency plan, right? So it's about planning. You have to think advance. Um, so yes, we can all, you know, I mean, think about all those guys. I, I mean, it's a perfect example. I mean, this is like real life, right? So in New York City, the two places that you really could never, ever pull people out of were Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. And the only places that those guys would go would be to each other because their teams were so great. Lehman Brothers doesn't exist anymore. A lot of those guys didn't know what to do. They wound up going to a lot of different, like I know a lot of guys that are ex-Lehman Brothers guys now that are in Philadelphia, that are in Washington, D.C., that are in all these other places because they got so caught up with the fact that things were going so good internally that they didn't think about what would happen if. If I had to look for a job, where would I look? Where would my skills be valued? And who could pay me what I need to be, what I need to earn? You have to think that way. Because unfortunately, the only career that we, the only thing that we control is our skills. We did this talk earlier today. I don't know if anybody was here or not, but the talk was focused, the title of the talk was Your Career is Your Business. And the concept is, is that you have to manage your career as it is a business. You, that's the one thing that you own is your skill development. It's your money maker. You control that. You don't control the ecosystem of the company. You don't control the ethics of the company. You don't control the financial viability of the company. I mean, your company could get bought, it could get acquired, it could go under, big cost cutting. I mean, if you work for BP, they lost, I mean, a lot of people are gonna lose their jobs over there. But when that happens, something like that happens, you have to keep your head up and looking for things to say, what is the long-term viability of my company? What's the sustainability of my company? And what becomes my contingency plan? In, in, in reference to that talk earlier, we, in, if you think about your career as a business, you are the product. You are the product you sell to your, to your current employer. Who is your customer? Think about it from a product management perspective. If you were going to build a product, would you build a product that was only valuable to one employer, to one customer? Maybe if the customer was big enough and you trusted them, but probably not. This is where your moonlighting question comes along. Do I, do I go out and have five different businesses so that I have five different things so that if one of them goes away, I'm okay? No, probably not. Because then you're diffusing your, amount, your ability to really focus and specialize and become known as one thing. Um, there's, the, a there's, old, a, there's an expression that I like to use. You, only, you, you can only run, ride one horse with one ass. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and really, so... But the, but the question and what Lee's saying is if you think about yourself from a product management perspective, how can you build the next version of yourself such that there are a whole lot of potential customers who are looking for you? Or at least you know who the potential customers are. You know that I'm really great, I, I'm a really great security architect for healthcare. So I would be fantastic in these types of healthcare organizations. Well, so if your particular organization, your current client, redlines the whole department and your, your job disappears, you have a list of potential prospects that you're going to call on. I mean, like if you were in healthcare right now, right? I mean, if that was your, I, I mean, I'd be thinking about electronic, you know, electronic medical record security. I'd be thinking about frameworks like high trust and high tech. Um, I would make sure that I was staying on some of the leading edge of those types of developments because at some point in time, my career is going to intersect with the market. And I think that, you know, a lot of security people say, oh, yeah, I'm a business person, too. And they throw that around like, oh, yeah, I'm a business person. But being a business person really means understanding the core business of your company at a macro level. Thinking about how the company is positioning themselves for the future what business initiatives are going to be on their plate, and how does security play an, an integral role in making those businesses profitable and successful? And you have to think that way. It's more of a mindset because 
the one constant in all of our careers, no matter if you're just starting out or you're getting towards retirement, is time. You think about that, right? I mean, throughout your career, you're going to make a lot of different decisions. And time remains that constant. It's going to, you know, you're going to work 25, 35. I mean, people might work 35, 40 years now. You start thinking about that. All the decisions that you make have upside and reward and have consequences. So thinking about how you're making those decisions and planning for that is a key component on how you manage your career. Yeah, the, the amount of time available for you to do things is finite. You, you know, I actually, I read a statistic one at one point um, that most people, unless you're an insanely dedicated reader, you will read less than 2,000 books in your life. There's 30 some odd, there, there were, I think it was 35,000 books released last year. Just last year. And you will only read 2,000 of them in your lifetime. The books that you choose to read are very scarce compared to the number of things you can do. Same thing in terms of skills. You're never going to be great at everything. The things that you choose to be great at today will have a big impact on you five years from now. And if you're not thinking about it that way, if you're just following the cool stuff or, hey, this, this seems neat. You'll, always, spend you'll always be late. Yeah. You'll always be late. It'd be like exactly. reading yesterday's newspaper. Yeah. You have to actually put some thought into it. Put some thought into how does this, how, how does being a black hat today impact your skills three years from now? Would you have been better off spending this week um, not in Vegas doing a business course, doing a communications course, learning about marketing, skydiving? By, by no means are we saying don't come to Black Not Hat at all. next year. What we're saying is... So if you're recording that, we yeah. didn't say that. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. What, what, but I, I am saying think about what this gets you because you're trading this time for something. What did you trade it for? What did you trade this week for? Um, and think about all the other things you could have done instead of it. In business, it's called opportunity cost. You're doing one thing costs you the ability to do everything else. So you have to think about that when you're talking about investments. Let me ask you a question. Is anybody, when, when, when we mention the term career investment, what do you guys think about? What are the things that pop into your mind? Certifications, okay. Anything else? Time and effort, okay, that's the means. Sir, learning something new. Okay, doing it for your resume. Differentiator. Sir. Okay. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. So when we talk about career investments, right? I mean, I think all these things, you know, certificate. How many people are CISSPs? All right, here's a question. Who's the best CISSP of the ones that raise their hand? How, how, do, how does that differentiate you guys? Well, where's the college, where's the college ranking? You know, in college football, you have the top 25. Can you picture we like the top 65,000 CISSPs and we just had that big ranking system? Like if you did something good, you get to move up on the ranking, but like you have a breach, you go down 2,000 points and stuff like that. You, you had a bad week. You have yeah. some analysts. They do like information security game day and they you know, break down the security events of the week. But so the thing is this, right? So the point about certifications, right? Certification, you know, there are over 100,000 certified information security professionals, and that's just like the ones that we can get data. CISSP, 65,000. So you guys should start feeling special. And SANS, there's 33,000 SANS certified people. There are how many of the certified ethical hackers? There's almost 20,000 certified ethical hackers. 20,000 certified ethical hackers. So we're all good, bad people. That's good. And um, I mean, who knows how many SISMs or CISs are there or any of the other certifications? Well, I think that the one thing that you can think about your certifications is your certifications signal theory. They don't get you anything anymore. 
That's it. They don't get you anything. They are the ticket to the party. Everybody getting a certification, I think they're all great. It shows to me in my line of work that somebody's committed to their profession. That Do I think that they're, that's, that make them great? Do I say, wow, their person's a CISSP? No, because everybody's a CISSP. And if you're not, I don't care. Because my clients don't care. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people rail on certifications. You know, I, the jokes about M MCSEs abound. But a certification, Lee mentioned signal theory. I don't know, probably most people don't know what it is. It's a branch of economics that asks the question, what signal does a particular credential hold? Um, let's just play a game. Imagine for a second, you're presented with two resumes. On one resume is an MBA from the University of Phoenix. On the other one is an MBA from Harvard. How does that, what preconceived notions did you have about the two people holding those credentials? What do those credentials say when you see them? And we've made a mistake for a long time that certification equals competence. It doesn't. Certification is a signal, as Lee said, for I'm willing to invest in myself and I'm willing to, be, to announce myself as part of the community. I am saying, I, by getting a CISSP, I'm sticking my hand up and I'm saying, I'm a security person and I'm not just a technical person. I want to be seen as a security person with some breadth. That's all it says. Doesn't say you're any good at it. So all your certifications carry a brand. Exactly. And I mean, so Mike and I have come up with all our, all our wisdom and back and forth on different talks and conferences. Three key rules or guidelines to follow when you're thinking about making career investments, right? So the first one is this, is that if you're going to make yourself better, that's a good thing. So CISSP, SANS, training course, conference, business class, public speaking, career coaching, whatever you decide to do to make yourself better, hey, it could be golf lessons. It could be wine tasting. And that kind of sounds crazy, but if you're in an environment where, you know, the people around you or the people that might control your career play golf every Friday and they need a scratch golf or maybe you're a great softball player and they need a shortstop on the information security softball team, I don't know what it is, but career investments are unique. So think about it, is that any investment in your career, it's a good thing. You, you got to do it. Nobody's going to fault you for trying to make yourself better, all right? The second thing is this. You get exactly what you pay for. Think about that expression, you know, that, 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 that scenario that Mike just put you through. And I'm not, we're not knocking University of Phoenix. Not at all. All we're saying is this, is that if you had to interview one person for a position and you said you only can choose one to pick, would you interview the person coming from inter University of Phoenix or do you interview the person who has the degree from the Ivy League school? So you think about what it would cost, A, the barrier of entry to get into an Ivy League school versus the barrier of entry to apply online to the, a, you know, an online degree program. So think about that in context. And then the other thing is this, is that if you don't take the time and the money to invest in yourself, don't expect anybody else to. People tell me like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm gonna go work for them because they'll send me to Black Hat. Well, if you wanna go to Black Hat, go to Black Hat because you wanna go. Don't let somebody else pick how you're going to spend your time because they're taking you places that benefit them. If you're writing the check, you can control your investment. You can do things that are better suited for your own professional development, not the corporation's development. And companies are becoming a lot less loyal. You know, it's the days are gone where we work for, you know, like our parents worked for the same company for 30 years. And the company took care of them. The company helped define the, the company where they gave were going to go. The company gave them leadership training because they gave them leadership training because they already had picked out the next job for that person. Companies aren't doing that now. So whatever that amount is in your mind, 
you have to think of investment like, I don't know, if you're saving up for something, you should allocate a certain component of your compensation towards making yourself better. Because if you do that, you will accelerate your career, you will eventually earn more money, significantly more money, and you're going to be smarter. But don't pick investments that are garden variety. Because garden variety only guarantees you sustainability. Some, somebody said earlier, invest for something unique on your resume. You know, to be different, to differentiate. That's a good thing. It is, a, it is always a good thing to have something that makes you different. So you have, you have to think about, you know, it, it was a key. So, somebody mentioned sacrifice, which I thought was great. Because, you know, you have to start thinking, like, the two components of sacrifice are basically, if you ask me, are money and time. I, I would argue that time is more valuable than money. Personally, I would argue that. But you start thinking about when you're selecting your career investments, right? These are the things you should start thinking about. So what's going to be, if I get this certification or if I get this, I do this investment, what's going to be my payback? It's going to be my return, right? And I think that the, you know, I, I, I put these in order. I, I purposely listed these in order because I think that these are the ways you should look at things. I don't think that you should do take a career investment strictly for money. I think you want, like I know a lot of folks have gone back to get MBAs and after they get their MBA, what they find out is that the job that they come back to is the same job that they left. They don't earn any more money. They're a little bit further behind the folks that didn't leave the company to get their MBA. And they say, wait, I just spent all this money. I didn't get anything for it because they're doing it for the wrong reasons. So I think that, you know, when you start thinking about these, you know, I think that money becomes a component. I think that it's an important component. I mean, but when you start thinking about these things, all these things, career acceleration, building experience, getting more access, getting better respect. I mean, you think about it, right? You know, you think about how companies are making decisions for their security leaders. When they look at it, they're trying to say, hmm, we have a candidate that's done the same things in their career as a security professional as we've done in ours as a CFO, chief marketing officer, chief operations officer, versus the person who's made investments that don't align with anybody else in the boardroom. You don't want to be unique that much. You want to be able to assimilate to a certain, set, to a certain extent to the people who you'll be ultimately trying to impress. But you have to have that, that has to be self-driven. You have to want to do something. Don't make investments because somebody else wants you to make them. Do them for yourself. So that assimilation is exactly what Lee was talking about earlier. In terms of if you want to be, a, be in a leadership role in security these days, you need to look more like a CFO than you look like uh, you know, the people who are speaking here. That's really what it comes down to. Next question. Somebody over here had their hand up earlier. Wait, before anybody, does right. anybody have any questions? I mean, we're so on the topic of investments. Anybody have any good questions about anybody planning to make a career investment? Anybody made one recently? Yeah, we're here. Well, is that really a career investment, right? Well, okay. So explain. So explain to me. Explain to me what the ROI is on this career investment. Yeah. Cool. So, so you're you're recouping it knowledge-wise. Do you expect any of the other things to come to fruition? Cool. I think those are good. I think 
I think those are very well aligned expectations with the investment that you made. In other words, whatever it costs to come out here, I think you're get, I think that you're definitely getting even or better money based upon what your expectations are. Let, let me ask a question here just about this. Just let me ask a question, show of hands quickly. Um, how many people in the room had your company send you? You're, you're on the company dime. Um, so about 75%. If, so here's another one. Curious. If your company didn't foot the bill for it, how many of those people would still come? That's great. Great. No, and that's great. I mean, the, to me, the quest for knowledge is really what drives us, right? I mean, and that, I mean, doing it for your, like, I wouldn't miss a black hat. I just wouldn't. I mean, I'm not going to pick up the same things as, a, you know, for, you know, hacking an ATM machine and stuff like that. But just knowing and listening to people, to, I mean, that's, it's worth it for me. I mean, in my own, just, just knowing. I mean, but I don't think that... Um, I, I just think that your investments have to align with the expectation, sir. We'll call him the man in the orange shirt, <laughs> anonymously. <laughs> Depends on how much of a masochist you are so to is, some extent. So is your friend wearing a black shirt right now? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, so, okay. So, you've gotten a bunch of some. Your friend has gotten a lot of work dumped on them. Okay. Okay. So I, I completely agree, and, and this is something, I keep going back to the model we were using this morning because I think it's a really effective model. If you think about it like a company thinks about it, um, often a company will take less on a deal initially with the promise that they'll make more later, right? You're not, gonna, you're not going to do that indefinitely. You're not going to lose money on a deal. You're not, gonna, you're not going to go into bankruptcy to make sure that that happens. But there is always a good reason to have some short-term pain to prove that you can handle the responsibility. And then after some amount of time, expand that deal larger and get more compensation. So, so here's like my favorite, right? And I've like the hardest thing for me in mo owning my own business that I thought was going to be easy was managing people. And it took me like, I mean, I don't think that I'm really great at it now, but I'm getting better at it, right? But I think the interesting thing is that a lot of folks, they believe that if I ask you to take on responsibility, as soon as I ask you to do that, pay me, and then I'll go do it. Now, the way it really works, though, in business is that I give you the opportunity, and that's what they have to look at, is the opportunity to build more skills, take on more responsibility, and show my value. Once I'm able to do that, now I've created two forms of value. I've created internal value, and now your friend has, has, has gotten external value too. So even if your friend's current employer doesn't see the value, that person now has more marketplace value. So you, have, you tell your friend with three kids to look at it as an opportunity, and make sure your friend takes his wife out to dinner. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, we're not paid on our potential. We're paid on what we've done. Not on what we're going to do, but on what we've done. I, my company doesn't get paid based on, we think you're going to be good at this pen test. We get paid because we've demonstrated a whole lot of success at doing that kind of thing. Lee doesn't get paid randomly to hire people. He gets paid, you know, that's, that's why they don't hire Lee to do pen tests and me to recruit. Thank God. We both, we both have the potential, I'm sure. But one because of, we've us. demonstrated w that we're good at one thing, 
and we have a long history of that, we get paid well for it. And it's, it's one of those situations, if you're not able to demonstrate it yet, they're not going to pay you for it yet. And so you have to take that opportunity as, as, a, some, as a somewhat variable window to give yourself the time to actually generate the history to say, okay, I have done this, pay me. Not, I could do this someday, pay me. You know, the biggest thing that I see is guys go back to get their MBAs, and they say, well, I just came back from, so get me a better job now, because now I have my MBA. I'm like, well, what have you done with it? Exactly. You just got it. I mean, so great, you've passed some tests. Show me how you've made an impact with that new knowledge. Show me how you've applied that new knowledge. Give me some demonstrable, demo, give me some demonstrated results that make you then more marketable. Exactly. Somebody over here had a question. Can you give some uh, specific examples of what you think of uh, really effective career investments that you've seen in the past? Re you want to take that one? I mean, I think it really depends. Uh, career investments are so personal that it depends on the job. One of the most effective career investments I ever did was I became a certified hypnotherapist. You're, totally all gonna give, you're all going to give Mike your money after yes. the talk, by the way. It's very profitable that way. <laughs> Eat more popcorn. No, no and it, it was an incredibly profitable thing for me because I do a lot of social engineering work. It tied in very directly to what I do. It's also way out there um, for this industry. I, I know of three other people in the industry who are like, you know, who are like that. We talked about being unique. So, um, but, but it's personal. That, I wouldn't recommend to any of you in the audience to go do that because that probably wouldn't do you any good. So let's apply it to you. What do you see as your long-term career goal? Okay. Uh, what, do you have an intermediate career goal? So here's the thing. It's really hard to put in context what a good investment is. We had, we had a slide in the deck earlier with a Yogi Berra quote. Um, if you don't know where you're, where you're going, you're not going to, you, you're going to end up everywhere or something like that. I don't remember what the quote was. But basically, if you don't have a goal, it's really hard to assess the, the return on investment and whether or not you can get there. Yeah, it's in the planning slides, Lee. It's up, it's up earlier. It, it, okay. So here, here's the thing. If you want to be in management, the, the, one of the things that made me a much more effective manager was going and learning about finance. Go take a, a, an, an entry-level college course on accounting. So, so if you want to get involved with, say, cloud computing and stuff, so one you know, the Cloud Security Alliance, I'd volunteer for a project of some sort. That would be a very low-cost career investment that you will probably get a huge return on if you take it seriously. And you're going to get around some really smart people. I mean, if you're into application security, maybe volunteer for an OWASP type project. I mean, those are, those are like things that you might apply to your desired area. Go ahead. I think my CISSP when I got it was really valuable. Um, I was four years into my career, and that was an uh, back then I was like the eleven thousandth CISSP, so the ranking system was a little shorter back then, so it actually meant a, a little. Mike more. was as high as nine hundred and sixty-two, but yeah. then he got knocked out. <laughs> yeah, I had that bad. I had that bad losing streak. So, um, so, so for me, right? I mean, some career. I mean, I've been very fortunate to have exposure to a lot of, um, whether it's through my recruiting job or through my personal people that I know, some really successful business people who I've done nothing but listen to, have breakfast with. Some have been a little bit closer than others. 
And people have taken me into the development of their company, the development of their people, their challenges. So I can't say that that was a structured, but I took a lot of time away from what I did to make sure that when I had that access, I was able to utilize that. I'll actually put, a, put another one out there because I think it's instructive. Um, I at one point took a job that I absolutely despised for an entire year because I knew I spent most of my career, early career, um, running R&D for a product company. Right? That's where I came up, one of the security vulnerability management vendors. And I'd spent a lot of time on the, on the product vendor side of the world. I had been a consultant, then I had been in a product company, and I knew if I really wanted to advance my career, I had to spend some time as a customer. I had to, if I really wanted to get it, and I knew I wanted to run my own businesses at some point, I knew that was my plan. If I really wanted to get, why does a sales cycle take nine months sometimes? Why, you know, what are the internal problems? I had to go live that for a long time. And that was the most frustrating year of my life. It's like method acting. It, it really is. Yeah, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. And I, I and so and talk, I introduced Mike to that job. Lee, by Lee the actually way. did. It's the one time he and I worked together. Um, in, in all offense, in, in, in all honesty, though, the chief security officer who directly hired Mike, who they were like kindred spirits, he actually left his job basically like three weeks after Mike started, and I that was unbeknownst to me. Yeah, it was kind of so, it was kind of fun. That was weird. But, but anyhow, but the point is, sometimes sometimes an investment is the next job you take. That. That was a detour on my career path that I knew precisely what I wanted to get out of it. And I knew what I was sacrificing. It was not a fun year. Um, so there's a question over here. OK, good. Because we only have like five minutes. Oh, seriously? Yeah. OK. Yeah, thanks. Um, not really so much of a question, but in terms of your investment, this is going back to time and to your point. One of the things that I have found to be a significant advantage of is internal or external. If you can find a committee, like with what you were just talking about on a cloud security audit committee, um, what's generally going to happen is you're going to now be at a peer level with individuals that line item wise are going to be considerably higher than you. So you, by direct correlation, you're, you're getting basically free marketing for yourself. You're creating a network and you're also enhancing your skills, not only in terms of understanding you know this scenario cloud computing but also what are the the heartaches that those other peers realize that they had to have a gap filled somehow some way i always quote from tom peters and say that uh that cool friends equals cool you um you are your personal brand is the people you know ultimately you are known by the people you associate with so if you want um, there's all this. There's all this work that shows the impact of social networks on personal development. You're likely to weigh similar to what your friends weigh. You make similar money to what your friends make, and changes in the in your social status change you very effectively. And there's whole bodies of research that I could spend hours on, but I won't. What's really interesting is if you want to be a great pen tester, go become best friends with five great pen testers. The, it rubs off by osmosis. And so as part of your investment, as part of career investment, who do you want to be friends with? Who do you want to hang out with is part of, is part of that conversation. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, as somebody who does recruiting, and uh, I'm somebody who's a young professional. I've been working for less than five years. Uh, do you, have you noticed any trends as far as um, age-wise or, or otherwise as far as um, retain, retainment within a company? I mean retention about oh, like I'm sorry, yeah, retention as an employee within a company in this industry. Well, I, I think that's very individual, right? I mean, you know, as far as trends are concerned, I mean, I think the company you know, different people different people get bored quicker than others. Different organizations have learning have baked in learning opportunities than others do. I think that the most important thing that you can do early in your career is find a place that will give you the ability to learn, that will give you access, and give you ability to maximize your value. I think that if you want to put yourself in a place that's not enabling you to do that and you've really tried to do those things, then I think that 
you know, you can take your experience and try to find an environment like that. Um, but I think that you have to really, you know, I, 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 I think you always, if you're ever in a job, right, I think the golden rule is that you should never leave a job until you actually accomplish something. I had this guy that we had placed like a while back, we placed him at a really large financial services firm, and then he became the chief security officer of an re online retailer. And he called me up the other day and he said, Lee, it's time for my new thing. And I said, okay. I said, um, well, how long have you been there? I said, you just left recently. He goes, he said, well, it's been about half a year. I said, six months? He said, well, actually seven. And I was like, how about I give you nine? I said, what have you done? You haven't done anything. How could you possibly move on to another job without actually accomplishing something for more than a cycle? To be able to see the effects on the things that you've done. So make sure if you change positions, you can point to one or two key things, key skills that you've picked up that you can articulate, expand upon, and share with that future employer so they know that you're actually doing things. You know? Does that help? Okay, good. We, we, just, got the, we just got this one. So uh, we're going to have to wrap it up there. So, but we'll, we'll step out in the hallway if you guys want to chat. We'll, we're around. And just make sure you get good advice. There's difference yeah. between advice and good advice. And there's lots of advice out there. So, Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you, guys.